Okay. So thanks everyone for joining. Today we have uh, Audrey talking about um, her recent work, correcting the meters of career regularization, direct alignment without overparameterization via chi-square regularization. Uh, you might already know where, uh, otherwise uh, she's a fourth year PhD candidate advised by Nan, that will, uh, Nan Yang, that will be our host in uh, some of the future meeting. Uh, she's working uh, in RL theory and combining these with uh, large language modeling and designing uh, probable algorithms for this setting. In the past, she works a lot in uh, offline array with function approximation, and uh, she's currently also looking at imitation learning, so many, many topics. Uh, and uh, today we are uh, looking forward to your talk. Thanks a lot for accepting our invitation, and uh, the stage is yours. Thanks again. Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction. So this is a paper that I worked on as part of my internship this past summer at Microsoft with uh, Akshay and Dylan. And this work is joint with Wen Hao and Tang Yang and Jason and Wen as well. So it's about designing better offline alignment algorithms by understanding why existing KL regularized methods uh, continue to suffer from this um, phenomenon called over-optimization and how we can fix this using a different form of penalty called chi-squared regularization. Okay, so um, by offline alignment, I'm referring to these this suite of um, algorithms, reinforcement learning algorithms that fine tune language models using uh, human preferences. And typically, uh, what this involves is that you start with some base model pi ref that's used to collect um, an offline preference data set. And this is then passed into an offline alignment algorithm that gives you a fine tuned model pi hat. And the goal of doing this is to tilt the distribution of responses in pi hat towards those that are seen to be preferred in the data. Um, I think someone, I don't know, like there's some background noise that doesn't really bother me, but I don't know if like, it helps to mute or something. Like there's some typing sound, but okay, thanks. So the offline alignment problem is typically framed as this like offline reinforcement learning problem in contextual bandits, where you have this offline data set uh, denoted CalD that contains n samples, and each sample is comprised of x, which is a context, or in language modeling terms as a prompt, as well as a pair of actions, a plus and a minus, uh, which are referred to as the preferred action and the rejected action, respectively. And these are responses that are drawn from PyRef. So typically how this data set is collected is that you start with some set of prompts. And for each prompt x, um, you ask your base model PyRef to generate two responses, a and b. And then these responses are passed to a human labeler to give you a pairwise preference label of whether A is preferred over B. And then A plus and A minus are assigned uh, respectively. So here A plus is given to response B, uh, which is preferred. And then A minus is given to response A, which was rejected. Okay, so the reason why this type of data set is immediately usable with offline RL is due to this inductive assumption called the Bradley-Terry model. And what this model states is that um, like, people contain this true, they, they keep hold of this true internal reward R star, which is assumed to be bounded in this non-negative interval between zero and R max. Uh, and this internal reward function is what dictates the distribution of preferences. So specifically what this means is that the probability that A plus is preferred over A minus is this um, Bernoulli random variable that's distributed according to a logistic transform sigma of the value gap between A plus and A minus under R star. And so as the, the value of A plus increases over the value of A minus, the probability that A plus will be preferred also increases in some nonlinear manner. And so because there's this like true internal reward R star that people keep track of, um, we can map this onto an offline reinforcement learning problem where the goal is to, from this offline data set, learn a policy pi hat, which is also our language model, that ha has high uh, expected reward under R star, which is defined as J pi. Um, being the expectation under pi of R star. And formally what this means is that we want to learn a policy pi hat whose expected reward is epsilon close to the expected reward of some comparator policy pi star. So 
Um, most offline alignment algorithms are based on this two-step framework called RLHF, or reinforcement learning from human feedback, where we first fit a reward model R hat from the offline data. And then we learn a policy that maximizes the expected return under this reward model, subject to some KL regularization with a parameter beta. And the KL regularization used here is defined as the expectation over pi of log pi over pi ref, which is a penalty that blows up when pi places a lot of um, mass on actions that pi ref doesn't take. And the reason why we use KL divergence in RLHF is to try to prevent the learned policy from overfitting to anomalies in the learned reward model, which is only accurate where offline data has good, co good coverage. OK, so I'll briefly mention, without going into the details, that there are many other methods based on this two-step framework including direct preference optimization, or DPO, which doesn't learn explicit reward model, as well as IPO and SIMPO, which add other heuristics or use different loss functions um, on top of this framework. OK, so even though existing offline alignment methods use KL regularization, they're widely observed to suffer from this phenomenon called over-optimization or reward hacking. And what happens in over-optimization is that over the course of the offline alignment process, what people observe is that the performance of pi hat or the learned language model uh, continues to improve under the reward model r hat, but the true quality of pi hat under r star plateaus or degrades. And I think the first paper to demonstrate this in some way is this paper from Gao et al. in 2022 called Scaling Laws from Reward Model Over Optimization. And this graph from that paper is showing the reward model score on the y axis. And the KL divergence between the RL uh, HF policy and the initial policy, which is some proxy for like how optimized uh, the learned policy is, and different colors here correspond to reward models of different sizes. So the dashed line uh, corresponds to R hat, perfor like performance of pi hat under R hat, and the solid line corresponds to performance of pi hat under R star. And what this shows is that as the policy continues to move away from pi ref, that the performance under R hat, R hat increases, but the poly, the performance under R star decreases. And yeah. this is, it, yeah. It's like, are you gonna discuss like why the reward model size interacts with this over optimization debate is? Kind of, uh, it's kind of no. weird, right? Like, yeah. it, is it is it not, <laughs> you, do you find also weird that, like the big models don't seem to have the problem? And the small mother seem to have the problem. So you would expect completely opposite somehow. Like, uh I, I think it's I don't know. I, I find it very hard to draw like something conclusive from this figure. Like it's possible, for example, that that like if the reward model is too small, that it can't actually fit the true reward model. But if it's I mean it's it starts to fit something, the data, I suppose, like if you're training it. I guess what I mean is that like a smaller oh, yeah. reward model could be more inaccurate here than the larger reward model. But this doesn't mean that like we would necessarily see the exact same trends for another data set. Um, and I don't know if like KL divergence is a perfect proxy for like how like optimized a given policy is. I, I guess, yeah, like the x axis is actually the like how far we go from the initial policy yeah is that even the policy that generated the data in this example or i think generally it may not be and yeah, it could not be sure. yeah. yeah 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 so i think like something that i'll try to make more clear later is that there are like many factors that cause this you know over optimization observation so we'll focus on one of them but this graph is just trying to show that like i don't know over a let's say a range of reward model sizes that like something like overfitting is still observed even though kale regularization is used right yeah um and what i wanted to say next is that like this is not just observed in rlhf but it's also observed in other like direct alignment algorithms like dpo uh, I think there's a lot of background noise right now still, so thanks. Um, so this is showing a slightly different kind of plot, but on the y-axis you have a win rate, which is a proxy for the reward score. And then on the uh, like x-axis, you have 
the, the training epoch. So one epoch represents one pass over the training data. And each color in this graph corresponds to running DPO with a different value of the regularization parameter beta. So over like a span of different choices of this parameter, uh, you can observe that the win rate drops before even seeing like the entire training data set. And this is something that people also see in IPO and other algorithms like this. So it seems like overfitting to offline data is still a real problem. That is in some sense like seen in many different algorithms. And uh, so this motivates the two primary questions that we're asking in this paper. And the first one is like, why do existing offline alignment algorithms overfit despite employing KL regularization? And the second one is after understanding this issue, is there some algorithmic intervention that we can employ to extract better performance from existing data by mitigating this over optimization problem? Okay, so before getting into uh, our results for these two questions, I want to clarify that over optimization, uh, as Chaba mentioned, is this qualitative observation that's caused by a few different factors. So one of them is related to statistical issues from poor offline to online generalization. But it also involves like optimization dynamics of each individual objective, as well as the heuristics and losses that are used to design the object objective itself. So like in this paper, what we focus on is mitigating the statistical issues behind over optimization. And we will try to understand the reasons why it happens through the lens of um, statistical analysis and RL theory, and then to design a better algorithm. So the main way in which algorithms are analyzed in RL theory is through sample complexity. And this describes how an algorithm's regret, or j pi star minus j pi hat, scales with a sample size n. And the sample complexity of algorithms is typically described in terms of a coverage coefficient, which is shown here, that quantifies the distribution shift between offline data gathered by pi ref and the distribution of actions under a given policy pi. And so it's defined as c pi, which is this expectation over pi, of the policy ratio between pi over pi pi over pi ref. And if this is a slightly unfamiliar form of the coverage coefficient, it's a lower bound on this maximum policy ratio that might be seen more in some papers. So sample complexity in offline RL typically falls under two main categories based on the coverage coefficient that, uh, that, that falls in the sample complexity. So the first one is called all policy concentrability. And what this says is that the regret scales with the square root of one over n, which is considered a statistically efficient rate, and the worst case coverage over policies in over candidate policies in the policy class pi. And this is something that can be extremely large, especially in uh, the natural language setting where responses are uh, can be comb combinatorial in the vocabulary. So um, it's known that RLHF can achieve all policy concentrability. But this is a guarantee that can also be achieved by greedy algorithms that simply maximize expected return under the, under the reward model R hat. And so this is a guarantee that is used to describe algorithms that offload the burden of preventing overfitting onto the quality of the data itself, in the sense that the offline data has to represent the actions taken by all candidate policies sufficiently well, so as to prevent the algorithm from overfitting. The other type of sample complexity is called single policy concentrability. And what this says is that for all com comparator policies pi star, that the regret scales with the coverage of only that comparator divided by n. And in contrast to all policy concentrability, we can view this as a data adaptive guarantee that says the algorithm will output the best policy that's covered by data. And we can think of this as some comparator policy pi star that has expected return that's a lot larger than pi ref, but that is well covered in the sense that the coverage coefficient is something like O of one. And the reason why we care about getting single policy concentrability offline RL is not just because like C pi star can be a lot smaller than the worst case policy coverage, but it's also because in general, we can't guarantee anything about the quality of offline data and algorithms that achieve all policy concentrability will have like no meaningful guarantee if we can't guarantee that the uh, data covers all policies extremely well. And so we can view single policy concentrability as some theoretical certificate that an algorithm won't overfit, and all policy concentrability as an indication that an algorithm is prone to over-optimization. And lastly, I'll just mention that um, 
Single policy constability is typically achieved by algorithms that implement what's called pessimism in the face of uncertainty, which means that they quantify the statistical uncertainty in offline data in some rigorous way. But the trade-off is that even though they get this much better theoretical guarantee, they're typically computationally inefficient. And so what we want in the language modeling setting is to get an algorithm that gets this guarantee of single policy constability, but that is also implementable uh, in a form for fine-tuning language models. Okay, so going back to the two questions that I started out with, uh, we'll use this lens of sample complexity to analyze the first question, which is why existing offline algorithms continue to overfit despite kill regularization. And the first result that we have in this paper is that is a lower bound showing that kill regularized algorithms do not achieve single policy constability. And in fact, they can be exponentially worse in their sample complexity. And then based on the failure mode of kill regularization in this lower bound, we'll design a, a new form of algorithm for offline alignment, which is RLHF with chi-squared regularization. And we'll show that this form of regularization is able to obtain single policy constability. And in fact, we can implement it efficiently using a one-line change to DPO, which we call KIPO. Okay, so as a brief outline of the rest of this presentation, I'll first discuss the lower bound and then introduce like the chi-squared regularization framework for offline alignment and describe how this can be implemented uh, as a one-line change to DPO. And then lastly, I'll show some preliminary experiments showing how KIPO does mitigate the overall optimization problem in language modeling. Um, are there any questions before I continue? I guess we're- I'm good, yeah. Yeah. I don't okay. know, I don't see any questions. Okay, um, yes. So, all right, let me now present the lower bound for kale regularization. So this lower bound will state that kale regularized offline alignment methods cannot achieve single policy constability. And the definition of what that is, is just shown again here. So before showing the results, I want to note that this bound will apply to RLHF, but also to DPO, which is the direct alignment analog, as well as these so-called like DPO plus SFT methods that add some supervised fine tuning laws to the DPO objective. Okay, and what the lower bound states is that for any uh, regularization parameter beta and any sample size larger than two, if pi hat is output by any of the above algorithms, then there exists a problem instance, which will be defined as some offline contextual bandit problem and a comparator policy pi star with coverage coefficient that's O of one. So it's well covered by offline data, such that the regret of pi hat with respect to pi star is lower bounded by the coverage coefficient of pi star divided by log of n. And by comparing this lower bound uh, to the definition of single policy constability, we can see that it not only precludes obtaining single policy constability with kale regularized methods, but it also shows that kale regularized methods can be exponentially worse. Um, and more formally, this means that to have j pi hat be epsilon close to j pi star, we need the sample size n to scale with the exponential of one over epsilon, where epsilon is small, instead of polynomial in one over epsilon, which is the standard for sample efficiency. And um, I want to try to give a proof sketch for this lower bound because I think it gives interesting intuition for why kill regularized um, algorithms aren't able to achieve single policy constability. And this proof sketch will center on the RLHF objective, which chooses pi hat to maximize the expected return under R hat with some kill divergence penalty. And the other methods that I mentioned, like DPO, will also um, reduce to RLHF in this construction. So what happens in this construction is that we have a poorly covered action A bad that the reward model R hat overestimates. And what this means is that under the true reward function R star, the value of this bad action is zero. But because this action is poorly covered by data, R hat thinks that it has a value of one. And pi ref plays this bad action like one over n of the time. So uh, there's, a, there's a big probability that this action is never seen in the data. At the same time, there's this good action A star, which will also serve as our deterministic comparator policy pi star that's well covered by data in the sense that pi ref plays this action A star some constant probability of the time. And so R star and R hat agree that the value of A star is something like one half. And so in this construction, what we care about is the relative probability of A star versus A bad under the learned policy pi hat 
And for RLHF, it turns out you can write this policy in closed form. So what this is, is an exponential reweighting of pi ref based on the learn reward model. And it says that the probability that pi hat will play an action is proportional to the probability that pi ref plays that action times the exponential of r hat at that action divided by beta. And to learn a good policy in this setting, what we need is that the probability under pi hat of a star is much larger than the probability of a bat. And based on this closed form expression for pi hat, this might seem pretty easy to obtain because we have pi ref on the right hand side. And we already know that pi ref of a bat is much smaller than pi ref of a star because it's like one over n. But it turns out that this is actually that that it turns out that a bad will actually dominate the distribution of pi hat in this construction because because r hat is overestimated and the exponential reweighting will dominate this expression for for pi hat. And this is something that's a bit easier to see if we plug in the parameters of this construction into the closed form policy. So pi hat at a star will be something like exponential of one over two beta. But pi hat of a bad will be one over n which comes from pi ref times that exponential multiplier squared. And I guess technically this is because like r hat of a bad was twice as large as r hat of a star. And so this 2x multiplier translates to a square in the multiplier. OK, so. What we want is for pi hat of a star to be much larger than pi hat of a bad. Um, but this squared multiplier will dominate the expression, especially as beta is small. And so in order to offset that exponential multiplier, we need to set beta to be large enough to cancel out the square. And this means it has to be at least as large as one over log of n. OK, and the reason why this 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 beta magnitude translates to the lower bound is because whenever we, we regularize with a parameter of beta, we also have to pay something like O of beta in the sample complexity for um, adding bias to the resulting policy. And this is what uh, results in the lower bound. OK, so if I have to give like one takeaway for this construction, um, in some sense, the Kale regularized policy has the wrong geometry for the offline alignment problem. And this is because the exponential multiplier causes the resulting policy to be too greedy or too sharp on the best actions under r hat. And you can try to prevent overfitting by and, and compensate for this issue by increasing the total amount of regularization and increasing the magnitude of beta. But this will cause the resulting policy to have too much bias. And this is what results in the sample inefficiency. Um, are there any questions related to this? or? Uh, this, this is pretty clear. OK, um, cool. So at least for me, I don't know. Yeah. Second time I see this. OK, um, right. So the failure mode of Kale regularization in this setting also gives an indication for how we can improve the sample efficiency of offline alignment algorithms, which is by designing a more effective regularizer that is able to strike a better trade-off between preventing overfitting and the amount of bias that the regularization introduces. OK, so our solution for this problem is this framework for offline alignment that uses chi-squared regularization instead of Kale regularization. And I'll first talk about the RLHF version of this objective because it's probably a bit more intuitive. But so basically, it's the same as the original RLHF objective, but instead we have this chi-squared divergence term here. And the chi-squared diver divergence is equivalent to the expectation over pi of pi over pi ref plus some constant shift. And so if you recall, this, is, this first term is actually equal to the coverage coefficient c pi. And at least visually, the chi-squared divergence should be a more effective penalty against distribution shift compared to KL, which has log pi over pi ref in this term. And you can also show that the KL divergence is dominated by the chi-squared divergence. Okay. Um, I think it's also important to note here that the chi-squared divergence is not a uniformly stronger penalty over all actions, but instead it's a selectively stronger penalty than, Kale diver than, than the Kale divergence uh, for certain actions. And these actions are going to be ones that experience more distribution shift with, with respect to pi ref. And so as I'll try to show in the next slide, this results in a policy that has better geometry for the offline element problem, 
because it's more conservative for poorly covered actions and this will result in better um, sample efficiency. So to make this argument, I think it helps to go back to the lower bound. So in that lower bound, uh, the chi-squared RLHF policy failed because the exponential reweighting caused it to be too greedy with respect to the reward model R hat, which overestimated the value of some bad action. Um, it turns out you can show the chi-squared RLHF policy takes a similar closed form approximately. And instead of growing exponentially with the reward model, it actually grows linearly with R hat over beta. And a result of this linear reweighting, um, you can see that the resulting policy from chi-squared regularization is actually more conservative with respect to, to R hat in the sense that if R hat is overestimated for some action, the resulting policy will be upweighted less. And it's also more sensitive to, to, to pi ref being less covered for certain actions. And um, because pi hat is less greedy for these poorly covered actions, um, as a consequence, which is something that's somewhat hidden in this proportionality statement of the closed form expression, the resulting policy will also be heavier tailed or place higher mass over well covered actions that might have uh, a lower estimated reward. So it might be easier to visualize this in the lower bound itself. So what I'm plotting here is the probability pi hat of A for the action A star and the bad action A bad from the previous lower bounds. And I've shown the chi-squared regularization, the chi-squared regularized policy in red and the KL regularized policy in blue um, for a variety of different regularization parameters beta on the x-axis and for a fixed reward model, R hat, that overestimates A bad that I introduced previously. So this dashed line uh, shows the probability of pi ref, and maybe it's good to start with the right graph, which shows the probability of the bad action. So what you can see is that um, the KL regularized policy in blue places a uniformly larger probability on this bad action, despite it having bad coverage, compared to the chi-squared regularized policy. But if we look at the effect this has on A star, which has good coverage, um, over the same range of beta, we see that the, the chi-squared regularized policy always places higher mass on A star, and the KL regularized policy only starts to place larger mass on this action than in pi ref once beta becomes very large. And the limit of the x-axis corresponds to something like 1 over log n in this specific construction. And if you go back to the lower bound and run through the same steps of reasoning, you can show that to have pi hat A star be a lot larger than pi hat A bad for the chi-squared RLHF policy you can set beta to be much smaller, so something like square root of 1 over n, which corresponds to uh, this location on the graph, uh, where there's this, like, where there's basically a peak in the probability of pi hat for a star. Okay, so the second property of the chi-square divergence that's useful for um, the sample complexity analysis that I'll show shortly is that the chi-square divergence quantifies the statistical uncertainty in evaluating any policy pi using the reward model R hat that's learned from offline data. And to uh, make this more clear, I think it helps to abstract away some of the details of uh, reward estimation with preference data. So if we, for simplicity, pretend R hat is learned via regression in the typical reinforcement learning manner, um, standard generalization bounds will guarantee that R hat is accurate on the offline data distribution, in the sense that if we take the expectation over actions drawn from pi ref, that the squared error between R star and R hat is upper bounded by some epsilon stat squared, which scales as O of 1 over N. Now, this is the offline accuracy of R hat, and what we really care about is the accuracy of R hat for actions that are drawn from pi. And this is uh, the form of error that we'll use for this is the expectation over pi of the absolute distance between r star and r hat. And to translate this on policy reward accuracy to the off policy reward accuracy that we bounded here, we can just apply Cauchy-Schwarz and upper bound the on policy reward accuracy with the square root of the coverage coefficient of pi, which is c pi, times this offline um, reward estimation error. 
And then I'll just plug in this epsilon set upper bound here to simplify the expression. Okay. And lastly, to, to align the right-hand side of this inequality better with the penalty that we have in the chi-squared RLHF objective, which is beta times, D chi, times the chi-squared divergence, um, we can use the AMGM inequality to split the coverage coefficient and statistical error terms using beta into two parts. So the first one is beta times the coverage coefficient and the inverse of beta times the statistical error. Uh, is there a question? Yeah, that's me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I guess uh, from here, what we see is that this is efficiently or effectively implementing pessimism, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it's it's it. nothing but just pessimism because, or like not yeah. but, but like that's that's what we wanted, right? Yeah. If you exactly. could plug in this, then like that is the the constant, the epsilon squared, the like the the, the term that scares with that. Like you can throw that away; it doesn't impact the optimization. And so yeah. you were basically maximizing a lower bond on the reward, like a statistically correct lower bound on the reward. Yeah. And what this doesn't account for maybe is like the covering the policy space. Uh, so that I think that that would go into beta or something if you actually wanted to have. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, eventually we want to choose beta to like, make this inequality tight, but only for like certain policies. Right, right. Not like all of them, yeah. Yeah, but and, yeah, effectively, yeah, you can see that this is like pessimism. Then, like we yeah, we managed yeah. to to write a pessimistic uh, uh, yeah, policy well, to, as to a be, solution yeah. of of uh, of a, a reg, uh, regularized uh, reward maximization. Basically. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe like maybe this is Which conceptually is, like not too. Uh, like unfamiliar coming from the bandit literature, but I think later on the cool part is that we can like implement this in a way yeah, that's yeah. easy to optimize. But yeah, you're right. Like yeah, yeah. I think what I want to say next is that this chi-square divergence is essentially implementing pessimism in this objective, and you can view this 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 error here, this this upper bound as like an upper bound on the maximum amount that our hat can overestimate uh, the mm -hmm. expected reward of any policy. Yeah. And so what this chi-square divergence penalty is doing is it's trying to like preempt and zero like negate a large portion of this overestimation error, specifically the one that's corresponding to coverage. And later on, we can choose beta in a way so that we only pay for some small amount of statistical error from this overestimation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let me introduce the sample complexity bound. Which whose proof will rely heavily on this offline to on policy reward accuracy translation. So um, the main assumption, in addition to the Bradley Terry model that's utilized for this bound, is realizability of the optimal chi-squared regularized policy for a given beta uh, under the true reward model R star. So this optimal regularized policy has to be expressed by the policy class pi. And if that's the case, you can show that for any comparator policy pi star. You can choose beta, which will be like O of one, O of square root of one over n, and I'm leaving out like a small detail here, in chi squared RLHF, such that the regret with respect to that comparator of policy pi star is upper bounded by the square root of the coverage of pi star times the statistical error from learning the reward model. Uh, and, that yeah. doesn't, doesn't beta need to depend on c pi star? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like it's going to be like one over n times c pi star. And yeah. if you want it to not depend on the coverage coefficient pi star, then you can do like square root of one over n. But then this c pi star will be outside the square root. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. I for sure like okay, sure. simplified right. something there. Yeah. And then if you like plug in the epsilon stat that you get from learning the reward from preference data, you will have that this bound is something like e to the two r max times like the coverage coefficient of pi star divided by n and then some like uh, like like function class parameters. Yeah. Yeah. Long. Right. Okay. So I will go through a proof sketch of this, um, which is largely based on the on policy reward accuracy. So as you recall, in chi squared RLHF, we choose pi hat to maximize the expected return under r hat, subject to this chi-square divergence penalty, and we'll treat this entire term on the right-hand side 
as j hat pi, which is going to be a pessimistic estimate of j pi. OK, and then since pi hat maximizes this term on the right hand side, or j, j hat pi, we'll use this estimated return to decompose the regret, j pi star minus j pi hat, and upper bound it into two terms. So the first term is how much j hat underestimates the return of pi star, which is the comparator policy. And the second term is related to how much j hat overestimates the return of the learned policy pi hat. So j pi star is just the expected value under pi star, uh, and r, sorry, the expected value of pi star under the true reward r star. So if we just plug in that expression with the expression of j hat from here, we can upper bound the first term as the on policy return of pi star, uh, sorry, the on policy reward accuracy under pi star plus beta times the coverage coefficient of pi star, which comes from adding this regularization term here. And we can directly plug in the previous on policy error upper bound that we had before to bound this first term related to the on policy error of r hat. And this gives us um the following inequality which just states that the underestimation error is upper bounded by the inverse of beta times the statistical error plus two times um the regularization term now if we do the same thing for the second term which is related to the overall estimation of pi hat we see that the second term is upper bounded by the on policy error of r hat under actions taken by pi hat minus beta times the coverage coefficient of pi hat. And if we plug in the same on policy error bound, what we see is that the coverage coefficients actually cancel out. And the only thing that we pay here is the inverse of beta times the statistical error. And so if we plug in everything above, uh, which looks like this, we have that the regret is upper bounded by uh, beta times the coverage coefficient of pi star, which corresponds to the bias that's added by from this um, from adding this regularization penalty that that contributes to the underestimation of pi star. And then for the second term, what we pay is the inverse of beta times the statistical error, uh, which is contributed by the overestimation of pi hat. And then I think this reinforces what I said earlier, which is that the chi-squared regularization penalty subtracts away most of the amount that r hat can overestimate the the return of any policy pi. And so what we pay for overestimation is just some small term related to the statistical error. Okay, and then eventually we'll choose beta to be something like the square root of epsilon that squared over c pi star, which is square root of one over n times the coverage of pi star to balance the terms. And that's what gives us our final result. Okay, so that was a sketch of this proof. And um, essentially by striking a better trade-off between bias and overfitting, chi squared RLHF is able to use a smaller um, regularization parameter beta, which is o a square root of one over n, versus the one over log n that KL required in the lower bound. Okay, and then I, what I'm showing here is a plot of the regret between pi star and pi hat in the same lower bound instance, where chi squared RLHF is shown in red, and KL RLHF is shown in blue, and the opacity of the line corresponds to um, a different choice of the sample size n. So the darker the line is, the, the more samples are being used. And then on the x-axis, we have the regularization parameter beta. What we can see is that um, overall, like chi-squared RLHF gets a better regret in this lower bound construction, but it also reaches that minimum regret for a much smaller parameter of beta than is required for KL RLHF. Okay, so this is a nice sample complexity guarantee. But perhaps the main problem with this type of framework is that optimizing the chi-squared regularized RLHF objective may not be easy. So in the paper, we have this oracle efficient method based on Frank-Wolf optimization, but this requires a cost-sensitive classification oracle as well as on-policy sampling. And so the next thing that I'll talk about is a direct alignment version of chi-squared RLHF that is able to avoid these problems and is based on a one-line change to DPO. Okay. Are there any questions before I go to the next part? Yeah. So, so regarding this uh, result that says that the single policy concentrability is achieved, I mean, doesn't that follow directly if you just remember that this is 
implementing pessimism and for pessimism we know this it's kind of like the proof also looks the same yeah yeah i think conceptually this is pretty uh like familiar to uh-huh to so, people from like, the oral theory literature like it's implementing pessimism and the proof is very similar to right to pessimistic algorithms but i i think i had to go through it to uh no it's, it's to yeah, to it's, offset it's, most of the burden of the proof for kaipio onto this section yeah but yeah no, yeah, yeah, yeah i yeah, think maybe yeah. the cool part technically is that we can transform this objective into something that's easier to 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 try and practice uh-huh okay. yeah okay so right. right so um okay so direct alignment methods uh okay let me let me start with Kale regularized RLHF again. So Kale regularized RLHF has this problem that first you learn this separate reward model, R hat, which is usually the same size as your policy. And so this can be pretty difficult to deal with in terms of GPU memory. And the second issue is that you have to draw some on policy generations from your language model to be able to estimate this Kale divergence uh, to optimize this objective. And that can also be expensive. And so direct alignment methods refer to this uh, to, to this group of algorithms that avoid learning a separate reward model and also avoid using on policy samples to um, instead learn only a policy. And I think the main algorithm that is used to do this for RLHF is called direct preference optimization or DPO. And what it does is that it maximizes, it, it chooses the policy that maximizes this objective here. So it takes an expectation over only offline samples, and it's essentially a maximum likelihood uh, like estimation objective that involves the log of this preference distribution here. And I'll make this more clear in the next slide. So I want to briefly derive the DPO objective to make the derivation of KaiPO uh, more clear, I guess. So here, I'm just repeating the expression for the DPO objective. And the way that this objective is derived is starting from the reward estimation objective uh, for preference samples. So under the Bradley-Terry model, reward, rewards can be extracted via maximum likelihood estimation. And what this means is that the true reward model R star is the reward model that maximizes this expression here. So it involves the expectation over offline data of log of the logistic function of the um, value gap between A plus and A minus under some candidate reward model R. And this is essentially the preference distribution uh, of A plus and A minus under the bradley turing model. Now, visually, this expression already looks very similar to the DPO one, modulo some transformation between the reward model and this policy parameterized model here. And that's derived using the closed form of the KL regularized policy, which induces some policy to reward link function. So what this means is that for reward model R, as you'll recall, the closed form of the KL regularized policy uh, is pi ref times this exponential reweighting of the inverse of beta times the reward. And then Z is some like normalization factor that ensures the resulting policy sums to one. So if you rearrange this expression, you can equivalently say that R is equal to beta times the log of the induced policy over pi ref plus some normalization factor. And so what I call a link function, and here this is like phi of z is equal to log of z, is this one-to-one -one map between rewards and the policies that they, that they induce. And so I'll equivalently write that R is equal to beta times this link function of pi kl over pi ref plus this normalization factor. And if you plug this back into the maximum likelihood estimation objective, um, you can directly derive the DPO formulation. So the Z here or Z uh, depends on R and uh, this, this equation that this one-to-one -one map is determined up to this uh, shift, which only depends on X or something like that. Right. Is that the meaning yeah, of yeah. it? Yeah, so the Z is like basically a dual variable that ensures the policy is normalized. And right. the, the important part is that Z is action independent. So yeah. if you plug in like this for A plus and A minus, the Z part will cancel out. Things cancel out, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for clarifying. Um, yeah. But right, so 
this is the derivation of DPO. And it turns out that for high squared regularized RLHF, you can use the same derivation to rewrite the RLHF objective as this direct alignment form, where you have the maximum over policies of this offline expectation of log sigma. But instead of only having like beta log pi over pi ref, what we additionally have under chi squared regularization is these this pair of beta times pi over pi ref terms for a plus and for a minus. And you can show that this is equivalent to solving chi squared RLHF, but only if you add the KL divergence in addition to the chi squared divergence divergence in the objective. And this mixed form of regularization induces a link function, which is phi of z being z plus log z. And it's, it's not extremely easy to give intuition for why you need to add KL regularization to this objective. But essentially, to make this reward to policy substitution, you actually need the policies and the reward fun the policies pi and pi ref to share the exact same support. And this is something that's enforced by the log barrier within the KL divergence uh, regularizer. And I also want to mention that, like, statistically, because the, the KL divergence is dominated by the chi-square divergence, um, adding both forms of regularization in will only increase the bound by a factor of two. Right. right. You, you have the logs, and so log makes KL much smaller. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so... so uh I have a question here. Uh, yeah. So if you don't have this uh, actual KL regularization, do you still have the the beta log pi divided by pi ref uh, in the object? I think function? the problem is if you don't have KL regularization, there are some additional mm -hmm. uh, dual variables that are not action independent. So they depend on both X and A. And then mm -hmm. those terms will appear mm -hmm. in this direct alignment objective. So you you still have to maximize it over like two types of functions, and so you don't like really gain anything from transforming the RLH of objective to the direct alignment form. I see. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. No I was I was also wondering relatively whether we can just change the KI regularization to something like squared regularization. Uh, somehow is, I have the feeling that like you, you want to have some strong convexity that induces some uniqueness, invertibility of this map from going from rewards to policies and back. You want yeah. a nice map that has some nice properties, and then if that is happening, then yeah, somehow you yeah. can directly optimize in a policy space because you would yeah. re-parameterize yeah. things in terms of a policy. And so for right. that to happen, you like if you only have the chi square, then like that map is not invertible in a nice way. It's kind yeah. of collapsing things. Like the you cannot you cannot recover the rewards from the policies. Yeah, yeah, I think. But but you're right. but 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 if you are adding something like this, like either the KL or it's just pi minus pi f squared, and like you sum over all the actions, something like that. That would yeah. also play similar laws. I'm not saying that that's a good idea. I'm just thinking about thinking a lot about the mechanism underlying this. Right. So I think like the key part is that if you don't have KL, you can't recover the re rewards from the policies or vice versa. But the properties that you mentioned, like convexity or having like one to oneness through like I don't know, like a unique right. solution. I think you already obtained that with just the chi squared divergence, which involves like pi squared over pi ref. But I think that alone is not enough to 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 let you make this substitution. But earlier you said that this chi square is equivalent to c pi, and c pi is linear in pi. Uh, c pi is like uh, like co convex in, in yeah, pi. but it's just linear. Like there is no no curvature. Oh, there is curve. Is isn't there a curvature? It's like in some c pi. A. In C okay, pi. Super oh, back. okay. Maybe that is. Yeah, it's like sum over A of like pi what squared A it? over pi ref. Oh, yeah. Let me go. Okay. But I think it's at the beginning. So, oh, wait, no. Um, First slide. Oh, yeah. It's here, right? So I think uh, it's not the easiest way to see it, but if you expand. I see. I yeah, see. It's yeah, like yeah, that so. is curvature. Yeah. Is that strongly convex or concave or whatever? Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So you actually do have that. Yeah, you do have nice curvature through through this regularizer. 
and it's still not enough. Yeah, but what you don't have is being able to recover like policies from rewards or vice versa. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think it's not like I don't know what the best way is of like conveying the intuition, but um, I think having the same support between PyRef and Py, like one to one support, is important for making the substitution, and that's what you need the log barrier for. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. So. All right, so let me uh, quickly give the sample complexity guarantee for KaiPO, which is very similar to that of chi-squared RLHF. So similarly, you need re realizability of the optimal policy under regularization. And here, like, yeah, the reward models are star, but this applies to having a mixed regularizer. Mm -hmm. And um, for direct alignment methods, what we need is bounded implicit reward. And what this means is that for the link function, phi is equal to z plus log z, for all candidate policies, you need the like, implicit rewards induced by any of these policies, which is beta times this link function applied to pi over pi ref for a given action A, minus the same expression at another action B to be upper bounded by B max. And this applies to all contexts and pairs of actions. And so something like a coverage term materializes in this assumption, mm -hmm. but I think it's perhaps like more appropriate to think of it as expressing something like bounded problem range rather than making any assumption explicitly on the coverage itself, where the left-hand side of this inequality corresponds to RxA minus RxB, where rewards are induced by this link function applied to candidate policies. And at least statistically, since you know R star is bounded in this range, you can filter the policy class to have V max at most to R max and still contain like the optimal solution concept. And chi squared RLHF, which uses a separate reward function class, um, only pays for R max and not V max. So, in some sense, this this V max expression is endemic to these direct alignment methods that parameterize rewards of policies. And so, correspondingly, what we get is that the sample complexity of chi PO uh, looks very similar to the RLHF guarantee, but we have an additional factor of V max in front, as well as this single policy constructability portion of the inequality. Okay, so I think I'm a little bit running out of time to give uh, like a more detailed proof, but it's very similar to what I showed previously. And there's essentially two main steps. So first, you what we do is we show that KaiPO implicitly solves the chi-squared RLHF objective okay. shown here for a specific reward model R hat. And then we can just directly apply the chi-squared RLHF bound. And then I'll briefly just show that the specific reward model that we use is beta times the link function applied to pi hat over pi ref. And the reason why we have that pi hat is the maximizer with respect to its own induced rewards related to the one-to-one -one link that's induced by uh, the optimal chi-squared regularized policy. Okay, so, okay, what I wanna show in the remaining time is some preliminary experiments with this objective. So I did this in like the, I don't know, like so a few weeks after my internship ended. So it's not the most comprehensive um, evaluation, but we're working on something uh, that's, that's a lot more comprehensive. So the task that we use for evaluating our method is TLDR summarization. And what this task involves is that you have some prompt, which is a post from Reddit. And you ask your language model to summarize the prompt and a reference um, response that's collected from a human labeler is shown here. And the quality of a model is evaluated using win rate against this reference response as judged by GPT-4. Okay, so what I'm showing here is the win rate against the baseline response for beta equals 0 0.05 over two epochs of training for DPO versus KaiPO. And so something to observe is that um, the performance of DPO drops after less than one epoch of training, but the performance of KaiPO continues to increase and uh, also dominates the performance of DPO after just one epoch. And I'm not sure that kill divergence is the best way to measure uh, deviation from PyREF, but we also observe that KaiPO is better at controlling the kill divergence between the learned policy and the base model. Uh, and over the same, the, the same checkpoints are shown in the graph on the right, 
where we see that Kaipia overall has a smaller chi-square divergence, which seemingly might transfer to better win rate against the baseline. Um, we also repeated this experiment for a for two choices of beta, so 0 0.05 and 0 0.005, and different epochs of training where we observe that Kaipio has a better win rate overall than DPO, and the gap between the two methods grows as the number of epochs increases and as beta gets smaller, uh, which is the regime where we expect, I guess, statistical issues from overall optimization to be more severe. Okay, so just as a summary of what I talked about today, um, chi-squared regularization in RLHF is this framework for obtaining single policy constability based on ideas from RL theory. And we can show that kale regularized methods are statistically inefficient in comparison. So using the structure of the, mo of the language modeling problem where it's this contextual bandit problem or there's like deterministic transitions between tokens, we can use tools from um, RLHF methods to write this chi-squared regularized method as this one line change to DPO, which we are able to implement. And so far it seems like it mitigates the problem of over-optimization in some preliminary tasks, but we're trying to evaluate this with more seeds and um, more problem settings. So yeah, I think that's all I had to present today. Yeah. And thanks for attending and for your questions. Pretty cool. Thanks. Nice. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So just a, a quick comment on Chaba's question yeah. or the link function. Yeah. I wonder if yeah. the mechanism that he was looking for is not really strong convexity, but rather having like a legend potential in the Buckman divergence. So that the have mirror a, map have like a legend, a legend potential to make like the mirror what is, map. What is that? What is a, like the legend? Like a potential whose gradient uh, blows up on the boundaries of the domain. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think that is like the proper. I guess that's one. what gives you the mapping between the, the log barrier. Yeah, 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 exactly. Slightly related to this, I was wondering whether. <clears throat> so, for the proof, I understand that you might need to add something like a KL penalty, but is it actually helping? Uh, you can run the argotem without the KL penalty. Uh, high, high PO algorithm without the KF penalty, uh, would it be worse or better? Um, is that's it a, a good poor, question. Is it a proof for the fact that like we still keep that term? Uh, you mean like the the raw like RLHF algorithm without? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good question. Um, my. It's guess is that it won't change anything change anything but i haven't tried so yeah that's yeah. my guess too because like you all, yeah. you also said that the k term is expected to be much smaller so it's like yeah yeah but i think there's maybe you know like at, at least in the direct alignment version like maybe it can help with conditioning of i don't know the problem range etc so maybe, it's hard to yeah, like, predict yeah 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 true but uh, maybe follow-up question, if I understood correctly, in the direct alignment version, you could not uh, run it um, without the KA, right? Because otherwise you lose right. this uh, uh, other form. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly, okay. yeah. Okay. But I think Chavo was asking about like the, the non-direct. With the error, yeah. okay, I see. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. And uh, even... What? I was not asking, <laughs> okay. I don't think that I was, I was saying that like this high PO that you derived at the very end, you could yeah. like remove the KIA term like heuristically and then try to see oh, what yeah, happens. Yeah. Oh, 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 sorry, I misunderstood your question. Yeah, yeah I do think, uh, so at least empirically, I think if you do that, the problem range becomes like higher variance. So like the log pi over pi ref term contributes some like negative amount to the problem range. And I think like okay. empirically this can help with variance. I see. Yeah. It could actually be yeah, beneficial. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I think we need to evaluate more, but that's a good question. Okay. Yeah. It's sort of weird that yeah, like that you have these two bonds, the upper bond, so they might be loose, but uh they have this qualitatively different 
behavior seemingly yeah yeah relatedly that was e to the r max in every single bound yeah. that you yeah. presented yeah which doesn't bother us if r max is one yeah <laughs> usually okay. r max i think is something like five at least from what i've observed from learned reward models maybe that's wrong um but i think this e to the r max appears in like all rlhf bounds because it comes from translating like the the bradley terry model like learning the bradley terry model to extracting yeah. the reward signal and it's from some like lipschitz lower bound between these right, two right. functions yeah. but similar similar quantities seem to appear earlier in logistic bandits uh, yeah and then people worked hard to remove them by did, did they yeah they did yeah like lower order term appears something like this but this exponential dependence shouldn't be in the one over root n term mm. yeah in in okay it's online settings and like there are differences but uh usually the idea is to exploit variance uh so the idea is that if you are near the end of the interval then somehow the variance is small and so that's where the r max is coming from when you're near to the end of the interval but then the variance is small so you can take that into account in your objective okay interesting. maybe yeah maybe that yeah, maybe maybe we can try that um uh, hey, i have a quick question yeah. chaba yeah. Has, any, has anyone done that this this technique of removing the the e to the r max for logistic bandits like beyond linear function approximation like is there anything that does this for general function approximation yeah we were doing similar things in a icml this year paper yeah oh okay tight i'll check that out okay Okay. Okay. Um, oh, hey. Hey, Audrey. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Maybe to talk about this, like, how much do you weight the KL? We did do some experiments where you do, like, yeah, you know, you downweight the, the instead of having beta times KL, you have, like, beta times 0.1 times KL or something mm -hmm. like this. Maybe the KL part's not that relevant. Do you remember what uh, are perhaps not very... Uh, statistically significant findings were for doing this? Yeah, I think if you use a smaller, if you use like beta times 0 0.1, so you downweight the KL. Like I remember it having empirically worse performance because of like higher variance, uh, but it's been a while. So, I mean, maybe that matches like your memory about it. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. By the way, if you, yeah, like I, I saw Dylan's comment now in the chat relatedly to this, like he's saying that you can derive your result, like the final result for any any decoupled coefficient for the two regularization terms. Yes, yeah. Um, and in particular, you can make that uh, coefficient for the k go to zero. How would that impact the bound? Uh... Like, is, is it like some smooth or like, it, does it blow up or like what's happening? Yeah, that's a good question. So like, my feeling is that it, my feeling is that it should affect like the problem range parameter, uh, mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. but things are a bit interrelated. So it's hard to say for me exactly right now, but that that's, that's my feeling yeah. about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess like there's a right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, the other says it doesn't blow up. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of like really subtle with these assumptions. Maybe remove the realizability assumption and then we can talk. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Because it's it, it seems that like yeah like now everything depends on everything else and like it's kind of hard to see what's going on. Yeah. Right, right. Would would it be hard to remove the reliability assumption? What do you think? 
Uh, I think maybe you can do some like approximation argument yeah. for a fixed comparator policy. Sorry, some fixed realizable policy. Um, so perhaps that's worth trying. Like you don't you don't realize like like Why any, do you, yeah. how, how do you use the realizability assumption in the proof? Uh, like in general. I mean, like in, in your proof. Yeah. I mean, it's at least okay. Like for the chi squared RLHF one, it's used to separate like the the two terms in the regret. Like, okay. oh, actually, like maybe not. Um, I think this is this is just the definition of pi hat no? to separate those two terms. I mean, like you can. No, no that that's pi hat, but it's not necessarily pi star. Yeah. Right. No, but then pi, pi star needs to be in the class, right? To have that uh, pi at achieve a lower objective. I mean, you can take the closest approximation to pi star in whatever metric and Wait, then... do we? Okay, I, yeah. like, did I make a mistake? I feel like what you only, like, the only thing you need is R star, not pi star. Not like the regularized policy, but you do need the optimal regularized policy for chi PO because yeah, that like, corresponds to R star. So maybe but you don't have R star there, right? So it's like you only have pi star. But why? why like okay, so if it's not realizable, so, it's not the end of the world. Like you think that yeah, like maybe you have some approximation error. Yeah, like no. misspecification error. Sorry, it should yeah, be I think that's possible. In a chant of fashion, I would think. Yeah. Why? Why wouldn't it? It will. Okay. So maybe maybe these questions can be answered. Yeah, that's a good point. Very cool. Very glad glad to see uh, our theory making some approximate impact in LLM fun tuning, whatever. <laughs> what well, when I was visiting DeepMind, I think I had so many conversations with people where they were like. Like RL theory is useless, you know. Yeah. Um, it's a you know it, those conversations are fun, eh? <laughs> yeah. So it's good to hear someone who's more optimistic about it yeah. once in a while. Yeah. Well, you make us optimistic. Oh, thank you. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um. Yeah. Thanks. Also, thanks question. a lot for your questions. I think yeah. it. Yeah helps a lot in giving a presentation. It really helps me to understand. <laughs> so it helps everyone. That's great. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thanks, Audrey. All right. Thank you, guys. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. See bye you. bye. Thank okay. you. Good job. I bye just everyone. click on this. Okay. Yeah. All right. See you. See you. Bye bye. Thank you.